Do you ever think about soil? <laughs> Do you ever think about soil other than when your boots are muddy or your vegetables dirty? Well, I'm going to talk about soil. Soil. <laughs> Without soil, we wouldn't be here. Soil sustains all life on land. And that's because all energy flows through soil, through photosynthesis and respiration. Has soil always been here? Have you ever thought about how soils are formed, where plants came from, and the tiny little microbes that live in the soil? Four and a half billion years ago, there was no soil. There wasn't even life. There were only oceans. And then at some point, between three and a half, four and a half, and three and a half billion years ago, the first microorganisms appeared. There wasn't even free oxygen at the time. But then photosynthesis evolved, and cyanobacteria started producing oxygen 2.7 billion years ago. Fungi appeared 1.5 billion years ago, and it wasn't until much later that the first land plants arrived, 500 million years ago. Those first plants, probably in those plants, photosynthesis arose from photosynthetic bacteria inside plant cells. That's the endosymbiosis theory. Those first land plants, like this little liverwort, they didn't have roots, and they had very rudimentary roots. Remember, there were no soils for them to grow in, only rock. And those first land plants were helped on land by fungi. And that's when soil started to form. Plants started drawing down CO2 from a very high CO2 atmosphere. Around those days, atmospheric CO2 levels were at least 1,000 parts per million. That means that out of every 1 million air molecules, 1,000 were CO2, and probably as high as 4,000 parts per million. So, Compare that to current atmospheric CO2 levels of 400 parts per billion. So those first plants started drawing down CO2 through photosynthesis, and in exchange for part of that carbon, that's the C in CO2, they got nutrients from symbiotic fungi. And then, soils started to form, and CO2 levels started to drop. Those plants and those fungi started to accumulate organic matter, and plant roots and fungal hyphae promoted mineral weathering, that's rock weathering, and this process of soil formation drew down even more CO2 from the atmosphere. And then CO2 levels started to drop. Let that drop. It's likely, and this is a theory because it's really difficult to look back into the past and make causal inferences, but it's likely that together plants and fungi reduced atmospheric CO2 levels from 4,000 parts per million to 400 parts per billion. <laughs> right, so I said I was going to talk about a cycle. Oh. oh. And this process that I've just described, that's not a cycle. That's like a one-way process, right? Like a dead-end road. Plants and symbiotic fungi taking up CO2, um, accumulating that CO2 in their biomass and burying that CO2 through the process of soil formation. 
If that was the only process, then soils would just be piling up carbon and the atmosphere would become deprived of CO2. And we all know that that certainly isn't happen happening at the moment. So there's one process that I've ignored in what I just told you, and that's decomposition or heterotrophy. So many organisms use um, organic substrates like plant and fungal tissue and other microbial tissue for deriving their energy. And this is a strategy that evolved long before land plants. Decomposing organisms, initially only bacteria and other single-celled organisms, later also critters like arthropods, and also much later us, we all use energy and carbon for our growth and metabolism. And in doing so, we also release part of that carbon back into the atmosphere. And that process is called respiration. So there we have our cycle. And actually, this cycle consists of more cycles. Plants use the energy from sunlight to generate glucose, that's a sugar, from CO2, and they store that energy in the chemical bonds of glucose in the Calvin cycle. Decomposing organisms in the soil can subsequently release the energy from those chemical bonds by breaking down those chemical bonds in glucose in the Krebs cycle, generating energy and releasing CO2. But they do something else too. When decomposing organic material in the soil, they release nutrients for sustaining plant growth. So, what would a world without soil organisms look like? There would be no decomposition, so plant material would just pile up in the soil. There would be no nutrients released for plant growth, and plants would stop growing, and the world would turn brown. We wouldn't be able to grow crops, there would be no grazers, there would be no birds feeding on seeds, there would be no pollinators that need flowers. The world as we know it would grind to a halt. That's how important soil organisms are. Right, so up until now I've just been talking about plants, soil organisms, soil fungi, bacteria, ignoring the vast biodiversity within these groups. And we all know there are many different, many different species of plants because we can see them. But for soil fungi, bacteria, soil organisms, we can't. And as we say in Dutch, unknown makes unloved. But soils harbor 25% of global biodiversity. In one handful of soil, you can find millions of bacterial cells of thousands of different species and hundreds of meters of fungal hyphae. There are approximately 4.5 times 10 to the power 20 nematodes, that's this little worm, that isn't visible to the eye, living in global surface soils. That's 4.5 and 19 zeros. And that equates to 100 billion of these little worms for each and every one of us. And together, they make up 80% of all human biomass on Earth. That's how abundant these organisms are, these organisms that rule the world. Yet we rarely think about them, and we rarely think about the intricate networks that they form, and the, and the interactions, the connections with plant roots, the result of millions of years of evolution. Millions of years 
of plants growing and soil organisms and animals on land and algae and plankton in the oceans have turned these organic compounds through the continuous burial and their subjection to pressure and heat into fossil fuels. Fossil fuels that we are now rapidly burning, releasing their energy and releasing back into the atmosphere the CO2 that's been locked up inside these ancient remains for millions of years. And that is causing climate change. So, you might think plants and soils have been able to draw down atmospheric CO2 levels once. So why can't they do this again? Well, the circumstances are rather different. Back then, we had no plants, no soils, and very little biomass. So just the appearance of those had immense potential for drawing down CO2 levels. Right now, we have a vegetated planet we have well-developed and sometimes highly weathered soils, so the additional CO2 drawdown is going to be much more limited. Moreover, this drawdown took a long time. 200 million years. But we are also disrupting the very plant-microbe interactions that are so crucial for this drawdown. We're disrupting them through habitat destruction. We're disrupting them by plowing up the soil. We're disrupting them through pollution. We're disrupting them through growing plant species in places where they would not normally grow. We're disrupting them by ferrying around plant species around the world, introducing them into soils where they do not have their natural enemies and where they can, as a result, take over. But we are also disrupting them through human-induced climate change. Climate change that is happening at such a rapid rate that evolutionary mechanisms of adaptation between plants and microbes can likely not keep up. So while many people think that elevated atmospheric CO2 levels are going to result in more plant growth, more ecosystem CO2 uptake and more carbon storage in the soil, the reality is that there are many constraints on this process. Not only are there constraints on land use, we simply cannot use all land to optimize ecosystem uptake of CO2 because that would mean planting forests at the expense of other valuable, biodiverse or protected ecosystems that store less carbon. But also, in many regions of the world, not CO2 is limiting plant growth, but water availability and nutrient availability. But importantly, climate change itself is already affecting the capacity of plants and microbes to work together in drawing down this CO2. So we don't have to think about this. When we think about the impacts of climate change on ecosystems, we think about the trees in the Amazon rainforest taking up less CO2. We think about permafrost soils in the Arctic thawing and releasing their CO2 back into the atmosphere. We rarely think about the plant-microbe interactions that are so crucial for ecosystem functioning and the response to climate change. So warmer temperatures will result in more plant growth in some regions of the world, potentially increasing ecosystem CO2 uptake, but they also result in increased soil heterotrophic respiration, releasing previously locked up carbon back into the atmosphere. But also an increased frequency of extreme weather events like droughts affect plant growth and soil microbes. Droughts can result in big peaks of CO2 release when soils are rewetted. And because plants are better able to cope with these extreme events when they are growing with their own microbes, we have unknowingly already compromised the ability of our ecosystems to cope with these extreme events 
and we risk turning them into sources of CO2 rather than drawing down CO2. So you might notice I can talk about this without batting an eyelid. I can talk about this because this is my study system and I can look at it technically and curiously. I can talk about this because I'm a scientist and I want to understand how plants and microbes communicate and how this determines ecosystem response to climate change. So I can professionally distance myself yet still be in awe of these wonderful organisms. But when I take one step back and I talk about what this means to friends and family and I look at my children and I picture the world 30 years from now if we don't take action now, that's when it gets me. But there's hope. There are things that we can do to make sure our soils do not lose their carbon and to foster the capacity of plants and microbes to take up CO2. We need to protect and restore our ecosystems. We need to map and understand the distribution of soil biodiversity and raise awareness of these beautiful organisms that are so important for the functioning of our ecosystems. We need to devise specific guidelines for soil biodiversity and restore and protect this vast reservoir of biodiversity of which so many species haven't even been discovered and described yet. We need to protect plant biodiversity and genetic diversity because it's this diversity that will help us make our crops better able to cope with a future climate. We need to understand how plants and microbes communicate because only if we truly have that understanding we can truly use that knowledge to restore our ecosystems and to make agriculture more sustainable. We need to let the plants and the microbes do their work. And for that we need to stop burning fossil fuels. Thank you.